All right, welcome everyone to the no dice, no glory.com roundtable for the HMGS CyberCon. I'm your moderator, Nate Fritz. Uh, excited to get started off with the first event for the uh, weekend of, of fun. Um, today we have James Pigeon Fielder from Colorado State. Uh, he's going to speak to us about running analog games with online tools. Um, please make sure to turn your camera off, mute your microphones. And if you have any questions, please type it in the chat and I'll keep an eye on that to ask during the Q&A session at the end. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Pigeon to take it from here. Outstanding, outstanding. I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, happy to meet with everybody. I'll make sure to do a quick audio check. Can you, can you hear me uh, five and five? Sounding great. Outstanding, all right. So yes, um, today I'm gonna be talking more about um, how to you know create immersion, like using tools you possibly already know. I have no hope to really teach someone how to use Vassal, how to use Astral, how to use um, Roll20, if you will, in an hour. But what I can do is show you simple tools and techniques to give online board games that that uh, more visceral, in-person feel. And this is what I'll be talking about today. So yeah, another thing this won't be about, it will not be about like online gaming in terms of like World of Warcraft, EVE Online. This is about, I want to have that human on human experience, you know, playing a game at the table with somebody. And so I have all these options and all these tools available for myself. How do I make it feel realistic? How do I feel like, make it feel like that I'm really there uh, with the person that I'm playing with? And this example here, this graphic from the Forgotten Kingdoms multi-user synthetic or shared hallucination, if you will, is an example of something that's kind of straddles both. Yes, it's a technically a multiplayer game in the sense of like World of Warcraft or something. However, the design is supposed to give it that more of that old school, you know, mid eighties, early nineties bulls and board feel where the graphics don't matter as much as the interaction does with the players. So to start, who am I? So I am a, a fairly recent uh, retiree from the Air Force. I retired as an associate professor of political science at the US Air Force Academy in August, 2019. Smart enough to teach there, but way, way too dumb to have actually attended. And now I've been teaching at Colorado State University for about a year and a half. As far as I know, as far as I know, and I wanna be proven wrong because I need to meet these people. I'm the only political scientist in the world that studies the politics of games, both game worlds, i.e. when people build societies inside of World of Warcraft or Dungeons and Dragons, and also gamer culture, like studying what's politically important to gamers and the gaming community. Um, some of my recent projects include a book chapter I did for The Politics of Horror, which was released in July 2020, where I studied a group of live action vampire role players in the Denver area and trying to understand how they perceive norms and power in the game. And right now I'm working on a project with two local RPG groups, one that just started a game, then one that's been playing together for two years to evaluate how they perceive uh, heroic agency in the games, both as a low level and a high level character and how it affects them as a player. Also run an organizational wargaming consultancy called Liminal Operations and a nonprofit research through Liminal Research and Education. This year and possibly next year, I'm also a Marine Corps University non-resident Krulak fellow helping a Marine Corps University with their wargame projects. I use games in education. I've lectured wild, widely, I've published education games. I even create for Evil Beagle Games working on several of their projects. And the reason I was very specific here about my military career in terms of what I did is that electronic warfare is going to come up, um, be very important in the next slide or two. And real fun, fall of 2018, I taught the USAFA War Game Design course. And at the time, and as far as I know, still is the only service academy that has such a course, which was a lot of fun. All right. With that, I'm going to start with what I call an analogy where... Like this is where I kind of get into why games work psychologically. And some of you have made, may have heard me give similar talk at Moore's or Georgetown University Wargaming Society, but I assure you, I'm gonna breeze through this very quickly so we can get right to the meat of what it takes to make this happen online. So the, 
take this, take a simple sheet of paper that you see right here. And so I'm going to look at and say, on the one hand, it's a blank page. And on the other hand, it's infinite universes. And for someone who understands the symbols, if I put hex maps on this piece of paper, someone who understands how to read that symbol is going to say, oh, this is clearly going to be a map. So I'm expecting to see some sort of terrain or some sort of uh, movement or some sort of key that's going to tell me what I'm supposed to do with this simple piece of paper. Fast forward into the actual map where I can look at this, you know, as a experienced gamer and go, oh, uh, what did I just do? What did I just do? All right, there we go. Um, I can read this and say, oh, I know what types of terrain are here. I recognize the colors. I know what the constraints are. I can kind of tell where the obstacles probably are just from previous experience. So basically, this surface has now been transformed into a challenge that I'm trying to overcome. And to make an analogy, and I also have a, a, a sad, sad electronic music habit. And I got into this partially from electronic warfare and partially from being exposed four years ago to virtual synthesizers and modular synthesizers. Why it took so long, I have no idea. But all I know is my, I spent years of my life wanting to learn how to play a music instrument. And I can even read the bass scale and sing a little bit of bass, but no instrument has ever felt um, right. They've always felt non-intuitive, you know, just confusing the bad surface. And we're going to talk about services again in, in a second. But then I stumbled across this program, VCV Rack, which is a free program. There's some paid modules, but it's mostly free where I'm like, whoa, look at this. Look at this. It's like, it makes me think of my tools I use in the army. And this is what you can use to make music. And this is all I could do to want to reach through and turn the potential meters and raise the dials. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. And my wife came in and asked me one day, three years into this, going, what is it about this that fascinates you so much that no other instrument has? And I thought about it and I thought about my research interests and my other entertainment interests. And I realized, because this is a game, it's a toy, it's a puzzle. To me, it doesn't look like an instrument, it looks like a toy. I am trying to, you know, make the correct sound, move the correct pieces together and in such a way that they get to the audio out, the objective, and make a pleasing sound. And it's an infinite puzzle because I have like 2,000 of these. So I have as many modules as my CPU can bear, plus now $2,500 of other uh, hands-on gear, which I'll talk about in a second. And so it's just, I can't, I can't resist. The game player in me cannot resist playing with this. And then fast forward to Oops, excuse me, there we go. This is how it looks when a, one round is complete, when one map is complete. But now, riddle me this though. This is now where I vary from other talks I've given here. Software engineers and coders spend a lot of time making these look like real pots and real faders. Um, and these are pretty flat. There's other ones that have shadow effects, metal effects, uh, burnish effects to make it look like it's a 3D pot or fader that you can touch. And that comes into you know, the study of haptics that, yes, with a computer, I can create any type of instrument I want, but fundamentally humans want to handle something that looks familiar, that looks like something I can control with my hands. And this, hopefully you can see in the camera here, like, but even this has a little hope I'm beating this. This is one of my new toys. I just got on a Wednesday, a Moog Subharmonicon. I haven't even had a chance to plug it in yet, but it just, oh, pardon me. Now it's going getting rated PG-13 here. So the same now can be said about games. Like um, humans can't resist handling dice, shuffling cards, touching the board. That's something a screen can't really quite replace. And with that now, we'll talk a little, a little bit about why games work at the psychological level. So I make my research bucks off of studying liminality. It's also referred to as the magic circle by Johan Wazinga. In wargaming uh, circles, particularly by Peter Perla, who calls it synthetic experiences. And in uh, virtual reality, 
what Nikki and other uh, speakers, like maybe Sherry Churkle as well, call it presence. Uh, presence being where you physically, when you're playing a video game, you in project your identity inside of the game. And for all intents and purposes, you are the avatar inside the game. All this means is that in a well-played game, the game becomes a liminal space or a ritual space inside which when the player crosses, that is their reality and anything outside of it is false, is fiction. That means that all the anger you feel, the emotions, the bitterness, the losses, all the successes you feel, all the um, triumphs, the teamwork, everything, it actually happens. Anything you learn here at the table actually happens. What let's, doesn't exist here though is the risk. So from a learning perspective, games are very powerful. And now you look at this, look at this map. Hey, Pigeon, I apologize. Uh, something got tapped and uh, you got muted during the presentation here. Uh oh. All right, I got you back now. Sorry about that. Must have bumped something. Oh, no worries. What's the last thing you heard? Uh, we're talking about uh, liminality and uh, where that crosses into some of the literal and figurative. Oh, sweet. Okay, okay. I didn't lose much time then. Sweet, sweet. So yes, I guess I can... So yeah, inside the, the game becomes real to the players and everything they learn inside the game or feel inside the game is real, but the risk is not. Hence why war games are so powerful. Training events can be so powerful and games in classrooms are so powerful. And from an entertainment perspective, I remember just being at um, Myths and Legends Con uh, three or four years ago and watching a naval battle with an elaborate table such as this. And just the act of watching, the water started to look cold. You know, everything, it started to get that sense, that patina of realism to it, that now that I was inside the space. So yes, this can be physical, it can be mental, it can be symbolic. Um, literally, the liminal space, like you go to play football, Oh, you, the act of walking onto the field and seeing the boundaries. You're actually seeing what Havizinga would call the temple around you. Or um, a game board such as this, you know, elaborate terrain or a training field for the military. Mentally, the act of picking up a deck of cards and shuffling them um, transports you into that liminal space or throwing dice. Hence, if I want to get people into the, to the mood to play a game, I'll leave dice and cards and kind of sitting around, and people can't resist handling them. And finally, symbolic correspondence is a little more esoteric, but this comes from a religion, an animist, original animist religion, where a religious leader might wear the skull or the bones or a skin of an animal as part of a ritual. But they weren't just pretending. Once they were inside the ritual, they were the animal they were representing. They transformed themselves, at least mentally. Now, a modern observer might say, well, that's primitive. We don't do that anymore. And I would counter that by saying, next time you watch a football game, see how many people paint their faces and wear their favorite jerseys. Or they go to a game convention and they wearing a cosplay outfit. Or join the military and put on the rank which by itself has no meaning, but carries a lot of weight for someone who understands what the symbology means. Ultimately, you overcome fear inside of a game, you're gonna feel real courage and you're gonna take that courage out with you. In any teamwork you build, you're gonna carry out with you. And one of my favorite examples I like to give comes from Tom Allen's fantastic book, War Games, published in 1987 and available as a reprint at John Curry's History of Wargaming Project, where he interviewed a number of players, uh, nuclear strategists in a 1983 war game, where it was just a tabletop game that lasted about a week. And they come into it expecting it just to be, oh, we're gonna move some paper, paper, paper around or uh, shuffle some you know, cards or whatnot. But 
by the end of the week, the players were tired. They were thirsty. They were scared. And they got to the point where they actually had to press a button in the game to launch a nuclear missile. And the referee leans over and whispers in their ear, you know, when you launch that, it's going to kill 50,000 people. They really thought it was going to kill 50,000 people. That's how powerful it was. And that, and that chapter about that interview ends with, they realized how hard it was to start a war. All right, then. What's missing, though? It's great when you're in person, when the, the ritual space, what did Huizinga say, the temple and the tennis court are indistinguishable? When you actually have a real temple or tennis court, you can st step in. Games creates, all, I mean, I'm sorry, online games creates all sorts of layers that we have to overcome. Starting with first the concept of the recognizable surface or surface avoidance. First recognizable, like the deck of cards and the, and the six-sided die are probably, you know, the, pretty close to universal language in human culture. Like I can go play a game of dice with almost anyone or what about a deck of cards with almost anyone. And we might not speak the same language, but we can play blackjack. Um, now you play online, Zoom, what the hell is that? Discord, Slack, I got to learn how to use that. It looks so complicated. You know, some are more intuitive than others, but that's going to turn some people off um, because it's not a gaming surface. They have to now relearn it as a surface or surface avoidance. And this is a, another way of saying Zoom fatigue, where they say, you know what? The last thing I want to do after being in meetings all day on this blasted platform is stare at a screen again for another four hours playing a game. And I've actually been there. So there's an act, it's like saying you're turned off by it. Like not only is this not recognizable, I just don't want to use it. Another layer. The human interaction is that the screen becomes a veil to communication. The screen makes audio flat. It makes us have to concentrate even harder on reading other people's nonverbal cues. And it actually, so that makes Zoom fatigue even more real because we're spending more brain power trying to um, understand communications from other people. Excuse me for one one second. All right. Um, all right. So um, next is then also the multi-sensory experience. We already talked about touching the cards or wait for it. You hear that? I bet you know what that's the sound of. Yes. Yes. You can hear it. Touch it. Dice. Just hands full of this. You know? And even smell. It's plastic scented and the leather bag. Um, or we might joke about players, you know, eating pizza and junk food and soda and maybe a few beers with a game. But smell is also a very powerful tr trigger. If I smell a slice of particularly greasy pizza, it'll take me back to a game I can remember from 1986, clear as day. Next, memorializing the event. Um, we log in, we play, we make some funny waves at each other and log out. Uh, we're not really, um, the game evaporates in a way when we're done, especially if we don't time, spend time socializing before or after. Uh, we're not, um, by not sharing uh, notes or sharing ideas or just heroics with each other in a form of narrative, the game doesn't stick as effectively as it does in online. I mean, sorry, in-person gaming. And then I'll say the pre and post game socialization. Yes, you might not want to be on Zoom, but there's something to be said we're enjoying a sandwich or, or another meal with everyone after the game when it's over, replicating the let's go to Denny's effect. So what can you do? The first method is, I don't know how much preaching to the choir I'm doing here, but kind of picking your common online tools of choice. Now, I'm assuming, assuming some level of familiarity with all of these amongst all the participants. The fact that we're all on Zoom suggests that you know how to use it. Um, some are great for pure theater of the mind. 
Like let's start with digital messaging platforms like Discord and Slack. My son swears by Discord and plays entire games using nothing but text with friends and no graphics. Um, Zoom, you know, there's also some people who do the entire theater of the mind using Zoom. Yes, they can see each other's faces, but they have no maps. It's just narrative, just discussion. Captured in the chat too. Um, go to the virtual tabletops. You go to, I, I will argue of all these in professional department of defense circles, Vassal is probably the most familiar tool. Helps it's also free and it's also open source with lots of games available. Heck, you can build a game from scratch using it if you want. And then others with varying levels of price and complexity. Cyberboard and Sun Tzu are also free. Uh, Roll20 has a, has a free tier, but it's not as useful. But then each one gets a little bit more complicated. Like I've had a chance to look at Fantasy Grounds, but not really use it, but it's also pricey. $30. Okay, a one-time payment maybe, but then if you're expecting all your players to pay it, it could add up. So, <clears throat> oh, and a funny thing, I've also read, um, going back to direct message platforms, some literature in the past year or two of people returning to play by email. I mean, not as old school as play by mail, but this really dropped in popularity in the early 2000s, but other now people want to kind of get back to that. I mean, they have, they have a sense of nostalgia for textual interaction. My advice here then, the method... The first method for creating that immersive experience in an online game is to just master several tools. Don't try to master all of them. Speaking for myself, I am basically using Zoom, Vassal, and Astral for everything. Um, I'd rather know them well than be half-assed in everything else, if you will. Next, the visuals. And yes, I'm going to use some religious terms here because, again, this draws off of religious anthropology and religious psychology. You're playing in a game. You have Zoom fatigue. You don't want to see a screen. Well, how about making sure everything around you is appealing? Like setting the, the, the lighting, setting the mood, setting the tone, and try to play in the same place every time. You basically want that temple to be recognizable. It could be your kitchen table. It could be your glorious office like I have here um, or somewhere where it's familiar. Like, you know, as soon as I sit down, this is not a workspace. Maybe it is, but you've sanctified it in multiple different ways. But this is where I'm going to play a game and I'm going to be in this liminal space for the next two, three or four hours. So what can you do? else can you do? You can adjust the lighting like I have in my office um, using colors. And I recommend keeping it dim as well. Yes, enough light to see effectively, you know, so I can adjust the lighting for maps and whatnot. Thing is, if you turn the light up too bright, uh, it, through interviews and my research and literature, I've come to see, oh yes, Mark, I did get my tabletop simulator. Because I think it did. Well, hold that thought. Um, if um, you turn the lights up in a room, people associate it with like the play is over, the performance is over, the game is over. It's like now you no longer have the mood of mystery with the darkness. You've lit in all the corners and now the mystery is gone. You know, you can see behind the wizard's curtain, if you will. And then visual and tactile triggers. That's where, yes, you're gonna have an online die that you can roll or dice you can roll in Roll20 or Astral, but maybe ha you have encourage people to bring cards to the table. Encourage them to have their their books, their Dungeon Master's Guide, or their Game Mastery Guide from Pathfinder with them on hand and dice so they can look around themselves and see the accoutrements of gaming. And again, it's a powerful trigger. doesn't seem like much, but just seeing it, touching it, smelling it, mm, that fresh toy store scent is enough, usually enough. And then before I get to communication surface, I'll just say I'm happy that I waited for a 25 year military career for a room like this, which looks like the inside of a, a, a B movie tavern, a yellowed paperback used bookstore and a game store. And I love it. And I love living down here. So it's, it feels like a sanctified space to me, but it doesn't just have to be the uh, physical area. It can also be your surface. Like, Adjusting the background in your Zoom, 
Like I'm a fan of having a tavern background. So it looks, even looking back at me, I can say I'm in a role-playing space right now. Adjust fonts you can. And if you, uh, um, depending on your what package you have for Zoom or Discord or Slack, see if you can adjust the colors and the layout of your screen so it matches the theme of the game you're playing. Off the top of my head, like the paid version of Discord, like Discord is completely free, but if you pay for an upgrade, which you absolutely don't need, it comes with some more of those um, uh, tactile um, accoutrements you use to customize it and customize it well. Oh, and then, and for Mark, let me d double check. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I'm so sorry. How did I miss Tabletop Simulator? I'm a terrible human being. Yes, Tabletop Simulator. Um, actually, Mark, uh, make sure, I actually want to add a note, though I don't have a slide from this, but I'm going to add a note about, specifically about Tabletop Simulator and design perspective at the very end. So thanks for bringing that up. All right. Next is the audio. Now, I um, will admit, grudgingly admit, that I have had as little, little luck with this. And this is ironic coming from somebody who has two mixers, keyboards, you know, you name it, you know, basically a studio in here. But every time I try to do ambient music or ambient sounds, when I'm running a game, it doesn't sound right. And it, people, they say they're getting a lot of feedback and artifacts. But I have two friends. I see Sean Patrick Fannin of Evil Beagle Games and Michael Serbrook of Evil Beagle Games and Michael Serbrook Presents both use audio in their games and they have a lot of luck with it. Uh, Sean likes to do music. He likes to, to DJ um, songs, if you will, varying from uh, like RPG playlists to actually playing maybe some 1970s Ozzy Osbourne to kind of set the tone. Whereas uh, Sir Mike Serbrook likes to use a playlist of ambient sounds from YouTube, like ice groaning together or the sound of a ship creaking or the sound of wind to kind of make everything sound more ethereal. The way that, either way, it's worth your time to try to figure it out and try to get how the sound to work. Speaking for myself, even if I'm just playing something quietly that I can't, no one else can hear, it'll help immerse myself. Um, Four, this applies just as effectively for in-person gaming as it does for online gaming. The concept of the session zero. This is where you set aside a day to meet with your players to talk about the upcoming game expectations and just kind of get, if it's particularly if you have new players in the group, get them to know a little, each other a little bit better. For online game, this is a good time to test your gear. Does everyone's Zoom work? Check. Does our microphones work? Check. Can they adjust their backgrounds? Do they know how to use Astral? Can they find everything? Better to do this in a separate session than to be stumbling around in that first game when you're ready and chomping at the bit to play. Um, both online and off, a great time then also to brief your expectations as a game master. Say, you know, at this table, this is how people will behave. This is how we'll do Robert's Rules of Order and so on. And also then you can get feedback of what players want. Like, are they, do they want a lot of crunch? Do they want a lot of, they a bunch of murder hobos? Do they want more story and less dice rolling? Again, all in or off, solicit it here. So when you actually start playing, people know what they're getting and what they're getting into. And then take time to socialize. You know, try to, to a build, I hate to say it, build rapport with the surface. Like you're getting used to these interfaces, you're getting used to the sound, the audio, whatnot. So at the same time, you're building rapport with your players, anywhere from people you haven't gamed with in years or you've just met for the first time. Now's a good time to do it. Now I do have a special note for online convention games, which I've done a few at Gen Con and uh, Tsunami Con, where um, people are basically just showing up. The, what your mission zero here is if you're going to run a game at an online convention, make sure you have a very, very good description of what your game is. So as soon as people show up, they know exactly what to expect out of it. And then also assuming the game convention is running everything correctly, they'll, you know, they'll provide you the link you need 
you can post it into as a comment to the game for everybody. And that way you can just start playing. Maybe it's just a quick around the room with everybody. All right. Then also useful for both online and off is the debrief. And this is for several reasons. From an emotional perspective, it's very important to debrief the players and the game master, dungeon master, is again to go back to the concept of memorializing the event. This comes from, I can't remember his first name, uh, McKay. McKay's work and saying that if you just leave the game, um, people don't, like they want to be able to sit around and talk about the heroics and the funny events and what went wrong, uh, maybe commiserate, if you will. Um, it could be a successful game where, you know, uh, Mike Sturbrook ran a game that, what did it run for two years? Um, they just some memorials the event. They set aside a, not just a session zero, but a session, a session Z, if you will, where they had just had a session to debrief the whole two years. Um, or I've seen, um, players who have played together for five years, who have a total party kill at the very end and decide to leave it like that. And that allows them a chance to grieve. So yes, it can be sad. It also helps prevent bleed. And this I think is particularly important for online because who here has work life balance right now? I don't. So we're carrying um, artifacts back and forth with each other or different mediums, if you will. And if you've never heard the term bleed, that's basically when events inside of a game start affecting uh, relationships between players outside of the game. Like they start blaming each other for mistakes made inside. Uh, debriefing helps mitigate that because you can talk it out and leave it behind in the magic circle. And then also this is a good way to um, honor Zoom fatigue in that during the debrief, yes, it's serious, but you can kind of sit back, relax a little bit, listen, uh, maybe not concentrate quite as hard, decompress, if you will. Now, from a practical perspective, too, this is also when you're make sure you've saved your chat if you need it. You've if you had a recording, make sure the recording saved if necessary. You know, gather up your notes and then harvest plot hooks from the players for a future. And then that's preparing for the next game's pre-brief on the next round where you say, hey, in the last episode, this is what happened. So, yes. All right. Oh, and to get to Ian Herbert, I am sorry. You said, oh, yes, um, I'm learning the ways of bots uh, through my son, who is a Discord fiend. Um, I have, I don't have much experience with Foundry. I will admit I have seen, I have seen it, but I haven't used it. Um, you also made me think of, if I remember the name of the, the program correctly, but this might be more of a design tool than a gaming tool. But if you need to save your, save your stuff in one place online, I think it's called World Anvil. Or you can basically, actually, it's a good place to put it here with a debrief. Like if you're going to harvest your notes, it's a good place to put it. Um, but I just haven't had a chance to use it yet. Then, smile and wave, boys. Smile and wave. Uh, you want that immersive experience? That means you've got to honor the end as well. Um, how many... How many um, people look forward to that moment when they say, the game's over, let's go hit Denny's or that greasy spoon on the street or that old dive bar that all the gamers go to. If you have time, um, do it here as well. Like actually have a meal and a beer on Zoom at the end of the game with your friends to kind of say, hey, let's, we've been, we've been, fighting together, warring together, gaming together. Let's socialize a bit together. And that helps build rapport and maintain it. And it's particularly important in these social distance times. Um, also helps mitigate Zoom fatigue in that there's no socialization. There's not as many like um, expectations, if you will. You can relax a little bit. It's not a business meeting. It's not a debrief. It's not a game. It's just you, your youngling, and your <clears throat> friends. And of course, then it's a good time to carve up for your next game. And my unpopular opinion, I've seen a lot of writing about this, like people saying, oh, it's silly to wave at the end of a Zoom. I say, do it, do it, do it. Because what, what online platforms don't have is that 
you know, you're leaving the person's home as host in the game. The, the little social mores we have, like the shaking of hands, the chucking on shoulders, the peace out at the door, that's actually important to closing a conversation and going back to memorializing the event. So at the end of the game, when it's time to sign off, have some way where you're kind of acknowledging other people in the room and saying, it's all good and I will see you next time. And then circles closed. Now, oh, before I go on to my next slide, this is, I do not have a slide about this. I thought about this um, about an hour ago and I'm glad that, um, let's see Mark B mentioned tabletop similar because from a design perspective, when you're building games, anything you can do to make a piece feel weighty or like physical. Um, I'm thinking, okay, this is a, a online or solo game or a, an online game, if you will, but like Medieval Total War, the original one, um, where you move a piece and you drop it and it actually makes a sound when the piece drops. That sound is like, it makes it feel like the piece actually exists or if someone grabs a piece and the color changes briefly, like given that, uh, that sensory experience or given that sensory tick, that, that piece that they're seeing on the screen, the screen is real in some way. Um, few things turn me off when I'm playing on a game where I feel like the, a piece is unresponsive or not responding in a way that I think it should, if I was physically handling it. Um, on the one hand, Tabletop simulator can frustrate people at first because it models physics as well. On the other hand, talk about a game that, or a, a platform that models the physicality of a piece. So if someone wants to flip the table, they can, <laughs> or, or throw cards across the table, they can. And it, it gives them that sense of motion. And again, a hands-on experience. Now, my second to last slide here is about, um, Somewhat of a difficult topic, I guess, in that as I, as I, um, well, let me back up. The genesis of today's talk actually comes from an article I wrote for Around the Table, uh, the Game Manufacturers Association's uh, house organ magazine, if you will. And it's going to be published in the next issue, as far as I know. And when I got to the end of the writing the article, I realized it's very cavalier for me to talk about online gaming when I'm aware of some people who can't afford to do it. I say Zoom and they're like $120 a year is a lot of money. And I was like, oh, okay. I didn't really think about that. Um, so it got to me to thinking of how can we expand the social network? You know, how can we expand analog gaming in such a way that we can encourage more people to play and break down barriers to entry if they will. And it made me think of, I've, I've had friends who've actually taken old laptops of theirs, refurbished them, and just put the free stuff on it. They say here, Discord is already loaded on it. Slack is already loaded on, loaded on it. Vassal is already loaded on it. And it's ready to go, ready to play. So I don't know. I'm thinking as we're learning to navigate this together and we're getting familiar with tools, find ways that we can either share tools with others or teach them, which reminds me of another thought. Um, remember the barrier entry is also knowledge, not necessarily cost. And our local, a local game store, Griffin Games, has a Discord where um, volunteers will actually offer to help people learn how to use uh, Discord and how to use different tools. Like, oh, you don't know how to use Roll20? Join with me and I'll show you how to do it. And so it's helped kind of strengthen bonds in the community, if you will, by having this back and forth education of gaming systems. All right, with that, that is what I have. And I wanted to make sure I left some good time for questions, comments, and thinly veiled threats. So unless anyone wanted me to go back for a particular slide for any reason, I'm going to go ahead and, and stop sharing screen so I can see faces. Yeah, and at, at this point, if anybody's got any questions, uh, feel free to um, pop them in chat. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to throw one out here quick for you. Uh, and it's Frank as unit was saying, see faces. Um, you talked about having that or not. Uh, I know a couple of people that won't DM unless everyone has a webcam because they want to be able to actually read the expression. And I think that, you know, is, is an interesting piece. Yeah. Um, 
you know, how much, how much do you think were, what are the best ways to overcome that limitation when you have people who don't have a webcam? Um, I've experienced the same thing. Um, and that's actually kind of difficult. Um, make a really effective use of the chat. Um, and how should I say, maybe be a little more theatric on the audio, like instead of having a, you know, a deadpan player's voice, you actually try to more, more embody the sound of your character, if you will. So when they're listening, it kind of transports that player to somewhere uh, different in their mind. Uh, I tell you what, for me, I would want to, I lean towards wanting to see uh, people's faces. Present company aside, since I know that um, it's being recorded and they're trying to, no dice, no glory is trying to conserve bandwidth. Oh, and I see Mark asks, is there a learning option you are aware of for a tabletop simulator? I am not aware of one. I've Everything I've done, I've had to do YouTube, uh, looking at any documentation I can find on Steam. Um, if someone else has uh, an answer for that question, please feel free to to chime in, either chat or audio. Again, how would you learn how to use tabletop similar in particular? I know with my experience for t tabletop simulator, it's really been uh, a combination of trial and error and finding someone who knows the system, um, you know, which I think is a lot like real life. Um, it's odd how much tabletop simulator brings that in. Um, there are a lot of companies out there, I, I wish I had one offhand I could recommend, that have their games loaded in there where you can play either a trial version or the full version. Mm -hmm. And I would start there that way, you know, you don't buy a product uh, and end up being frustrated with the experience. Right. I could also speak, this is one case example, but I was at the Nasaga North American, North American Simulation and Gaming Association convention a few weeks ago online. And I sat in and watched a uh, teacher who said she uses a tabletop simulator to run a classroom game. And it's actually quote one of her textbooks, like the students are required to buy it. And her experience, she said she found it fairly intuitive. And she just walked through a quick example of how she built a game to the prototype level. Um, and it's, I'd say fairly plug and play drag and drop. Yeah. I will, I will admit I found Vassal intimidating the first time I used it. That it is. Um, I, I used Vassal for the first time a week ago and it's got me thinking about uh, a time component. Do you think um, there's something for, you know, when, when you have the challenges of uh, a digital interface, um, either playing shorter sessions or expecting to accomplish less in a session is something that we set out. Um, because one of the other things I've seen uh, a couple of my groups doing is we play bi-weekly for our normal games, but then we mm -hmm. intersperse it with something like Among Us for a half hour or an hour to keep people from getting that, you know, multiple hours in front of the screen on top of a work day. Yeah. Oh, and I see, I see, I see Scott, let's see, Pigeon, have you been teaching any Wargame courses online? How was the experience or any tips? Um, the uh, bad news is I've only taught some one-off courses, like single lessons. I haven't taught a, a full-up course. Um, <laughs> it's actually one of my most recommended people. Oh, you can teach war games? Can you do an online course? I'm like, uh, sure, sure, sure. I'll, I'll think of something. So it's something I'd like to do, but I haven't done. Uh, now, in terms of now being a prof in terms of the second half of the question, separate from war gaming. Um, just teaching online, like teaching Colorado State University. You know, we taught all online at the, at the end of spring break last spring, and I taught online in the summer, and I'm going to all online after fall break. Um, and I've actually gotten fairly used to um, using Zoom to do it. And I've actually found the Robert Rules of Order has been fairly simple. Um, so far, it seems socially, people don't seem to like to talk over each other. So... I don't have that much trouble kind of uh, corralling the room, if you will. And also some students are also more open to using chat versus talking. 
So I've also learned, you know, going back and forth and I find the chat to be very descriptive and then I could save it for later too, for harvesting. Um, that's probably not the answer you were looking for, but I'm putting two together. Like, let's say, okay, let's say here's what I'm recording that the pigeon will make an online game course. War game course, yes. Because why the hell not? <clears throat> we've we, we've got it on video, so it's going to happen. Um, <laughs> to that point, I would say I was actually in the Moore's War Gaming course, and it was interesting. Depending on the level, it can still be pretty easy to get people adjusted to things. And I know mm -hmm. for um, the folks who had very little gaming experience, um, one of the pro uh, examples we did it was a PowerPoint slide with blocks on it that you moved around. And as long as you don't try and do too much, uh, it actually worked pretty well to illustrate some basic concepts, get people going. I think, you know, as in real life, when we start to scale is where some of that complexity gets difficult. But um, you actually just reminded me, um, there are the Moore's Cyber War Gaming course in, in January, January 2021. I might be one of the instructors for it. And that's going to be all online as far as I know. But I certainly won't be teaching the whole course. It'd be like uh, two or three lessons of it. I'm, I'm curious with a piece, you know, you talked about electronic warfare coming in at the beginning. And how do you think that ties into uh, directly with some of what you're talking about with the analog experience? Because I, I know you mentioned there was a tie-in and I think maybe I, I missed it as you were going through. Oh, it has to do with just um, the music aspect. Like... Like how I had so much trouble learning an instrument, but but I looked at a, a machine that kind of looked to me like an electronic warfare console. It was easier for me to pick up and it just felt more, I hate to say it's sensual. Like I wanted to touch it, turn the dials and, you know, the knobs and raise levers and just see what kind of, and put on hiking the scopes to see what kind of crazy frequency patterns I could create, you know, blow the speakers out, drive my wife crazy and the cat as well. Yeah, uh, that's interesting because I think as you were listing out the different ones, depending on your game, um, a miniatures game tabletop simulator might be better because you can pick them up and set them down. Um, mm. But with like a D and D uh, systems, like I I know Fantasy Grounds does it where your character reveals the map as they move along, so you mm -hmm. actually have that kind of fog of adventure. That's a good point uh, because that is an advantage that. Uh... Something you can do in Astral and Roll20 is have that, you know, that fog of war, line of sight, um, you know, weapons effects, like weapons distances. Uh, so actually when I was giving a, a talk, a talk at Nasaga a few weeks ago and talking about Astral, there was an army a colonel on asking about the utility of VTTs. And I said, well, you know, these are largely used for entertainment purposes, but I could on Astral, uh, have a stack of infantry lined up and uh, depending how I arrange uh, the map and the fog of war, I can make it play out. Like if, yes, this is a tactical on-screen game, but now you're seeing what they would see and you can only fire as far as their actual weapons can fire. So it adds on a lot of layers of, re of realism, if you will, without that much effort to add. It's, yeah, I've heard a couple of different systems talked about with that. And it seems like one of the big pieces is look at the game you want to play, and then you just have to do some research into the system. Mm -hmm. And one of the big pieces to getting that liminality in is a little bit of extra prep work really on you know DMs or people who want to run the games because right. you can help kind of be the Sherpa to guide everyone up that mountain. So actually, I have a question for the group, if I may. So I, you know, gave these ideas. What has worked well for you? Like, what other tools and techniques have other have the audience used that you've thought have worked really well? I, I think from uh, my perspective, while people are writing things in, um, really, you covered most of the ones I've looked at uh, and seen other people use pretty well, but. One of the big things is uh, blocking out more time. So I've moved new new games are purely something I do on the weekend because then it's easier to set up you know time to learn a system and learn a you know interface for it as well. Mm 
Um, and then uh, having cameras on. Uh, luckily, most people I know have a camera and being able to still see each other, like you're talking about, really helps that social aspect may, uh, yeah. be held together. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, Mark. I've actually, for me, that seems awfully complicated, but why the hell not? I've, I've, I've heard of friends who actually will set up real, like not a vassal game, not a, you know, not an astro game, but an actual physical board and have camera systems that are pointing so they can actually see the hands moving pieces and feel it, touch it, if you will. Yeah. So just so everyone who's listening can see, because I don't think the chat get captured. Uh, Mark mentioned friends using tabletops and webcams to capture it. Um, to the game by mail, game by email system, uh, mm -hmm. I've been playing with friends where one of the guys has his entire basement. Uh, I don't know how he sold his wife to it, but it's all set up as the battle space right now. And we're doing a Pacific naval campaign. Uh, orders are issued through email. Um, and it's wow. fun because he does a bit of a selective adjudication to where you are allowed to issue vague orders and he is allowed to ignore or interpret them as he will, um, which has led to a couple of occasions where our previous version was a tank battle and uh, our tank once drove into the middle of the field because we said, you know, advance west. And he was like, well, there's not actually a compass attached to this because of the, the setting. Um, so they drove roughly where they thought they should be. And uh, there were consequences. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. That uh, it, it, it's a different experience, I think. And that's one of the things that um, I really enjoyed about that game is, you know, the, the delay, but also the realism of, you know, how much, how well do you write out your order? Right. Uh, looks like Ian say in his group uses discord and roll 20. Um, roll 20 has seemed rather limiting, but it could be their implementation. Uh, and it allows them to link with, um, character sheets from the D and D website directly to the tabletop, which is helpful. Um, they've been looking for alternatives since the experience seems clunky. And I, I think that's where I've seen, um, depending upon the group and what you can afford, uh, things like Astral and Fantasy Grounds or paid features of Roll20 really give people an experience. Yeah. Yeah, it's anything you can make something less clunky. Uh, remove the surf surface tension, if you will, you know. Oh, yeah, uh, Frank, as far as I know, this is going to be recorded and I think posted t either later tonight or tomorrow. But I, I did the double check with the admins, the hosts on that. Um, yep. Well, as, as we're getting ready to wrap up here, I will let everyone know that these will be posted on the No Dice, No Glory YouTube. I don't have a solid timeline on when they'll be up there, but I know the last time we did this, they got up there pretty quick. I'm just not the guy doing that work, so I'm not going to volunteer anybody's timeline. <laughs> oh, and then Mark brings up the, you know, the idea of if you want, you know, having a club, a wargaming club where you actually share resources around, like maybe all chip in for a Zoom account um, or you know, all chip in for a program that you can be used. I like that idea. Yeah, it looks like Scott's saying they've been using PowerPoint shared drives um, and adding some OBS effects. I've for some reason, the acronym's avoiding me there. See, I know what OBS is, but I can't remember what it stands for. It's <laughs> an audio, right? Um, we'll put Scott, everyone stare at Scott uncomfortably until he, <laughs> he types out OBS. We'll, we'll keep him on the spot. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's it. That's it. So it's like you had an audio tool. Open broadcast software. Got it. Um, Shared drives. Actually, uh, I learned, um, I haven't had a chance to use it because I only learned how to do this about two or three weeks ago, but I've, yeah, I learned how to do, I saw examples of people building very elaborate Google drive setups that actually building, you know, maps inside of it, you know, movable maps with links to, you know, data, you know, all their character sheets, you know, fog of war, like saying, well, you can't access, you know, limiting people's access to different information. Um, 
It's one of those things where it just seems like it might just be tedious to set up and a time consuming the first time. But once you have a good system set up, it can be easy to maintain. Yeah. All right. Well, we've, we've got about five minutes left here. Um, so Pigeon, if you have any closing thoughts, if anyone has any closing uh, questions, pop them in the chat. Um, we'll get those addressed. Otherwise, uh, I'll get ready to wrap it up for us here. Just uh, very happy to be here. Very happy to be the the lowly street pigeon who opened up this this workshop for the next couple of days. And I encourage you to game on in the best way that you can. All right. Uh, yeah, it looks like Scott's been able to use Vassal Skype and Skype to run a couple games for the Canadian military. Um, I think the, the multiple locations piece is actually a big thing from the professional side and the hobby side. You know, I've been able to game with friends that I haven't actually played with in years. Um, and for the military side, uh, every deployment I've been on, I've been calling and working with people who are not next to me. So it's a very authentic experience. <laughs> Oh, you know what? One thing before anyone, even though it was on my slides, if anyone wants to contact me here, ping me at Colorado State and I can talk games. I got a 10 page game design handout that I created for CSU, a faculty I'm willing to give out uh, anything, anything. It is, yeah, it is a, a great for. handout. <laughs> I've, I've got a copy from you that I've referenced more than a handful of times. So, um, I think on that note, I'm going to say uh, thank you very much, Pigeon, for your time. It was a great talk. I think it's very useful for us to think about in these days where we've probably still got at least another couple of months ahead of us. Um, so no dice, no glory.com and HMGS would like to thank you for your time. Um, videos will be up on YouTube, everybody. Uh, I'm not quite sure on the timeline there, but keep an eye out. They'll pop up. Uh, and you can also visit the no dice, no glory.com message boards to continue the conversation. Uh, and thank you all very much for joining us for this session. I hope everyone has a good evening and uh, look forward to seeing you all around the rest of the talks this weekend. Sweet. Awesome. All right. And then uh, Pigeon, I'll let you wave us out. <laughs> Sweet. Good deal.